Welcome back and joining us now is mayoral candidate Doreen McKesson. You may recognize him as one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Thanks for coming by, it's man. It's good to be here. Talk to me about this run, because this is interesting. You, you made your, uh, your face became known on Twitter. Now you want public office. What's most important here? Is it the office or do you think getting the message of the movement out when it comes to your campaign? You know, I began as an organizer in Baltimore in 1999. Yeah. I was a teacher, opened up an after school center, was mm -hmm. a number two here in human capital for city schools, and for the last 18 months have been a leader working on issues around police violence, both here and across the country. When I think about the movement, it was focused on bringing attention to a crisis around policing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know that policing is not the only issue that's really important in cities like ours, definitely in Baltimore. So as mayor, it puts me in a position to do the concrete things that we know will make the city better, that will change people's lives today and tomorrow. So it's about education, crime, and safety, but it's it's also about public health, sure. transportation, infrastructure, it's all of those issues. And I have the most robust platform out there. Talk to me a little bit about the movement because I know that it resonates different with different people. Would that make your administration, would that be a big challenge for you, do you think, um, with you being the face of the movement? Do you think, would that be a challenge working within a construct where not everyone is part of it? You know, we knock a, a thousand doors yeah. a night. And when I talk to people, they understand that the movement was about justice and equity okay. and equality. And that it's about how do we make the city safer, knowing that police are a part of it, but safety is a much more expansive issue than policing. Yeah. That if I ask you where you feel the most safe, it's probably not in a room full of police. It's probably where there are people who love you, where there's food and shelter. And then sure. the question becomes, how do we scale that? So I think that people understand it. And when people ask me about the platform, when we get to talk about policy issues, about vacant homes, and about food deserts, and about public health, people, it resonates with them. Yeah, let's talk safety a little bit. We had two incidents just in a matter of days. One, there was a police arrest that was uh, recorded and made a lot of noise as well. Uh, just last night, there was a woman uh, who hit a police officer, dragged him with the car. So both sides, just a, a big issue here. How do we resolve this relationship? How do we return it to something where it's respectful for both sides? Yeah, so I, when I think about the police, or when people think about officers, they think about three buckets primarily. One okay. is about crime prevention, but the crime prevention work really isn't police work. That's strong schools, families, jobs. So I'm calling for us to cut 1% of the police department budget uh, at the beginning and reinvest it in prevention work. So you think about Baltimore, there are three movie theaters, the Charles, the Senator, Harbor East. There's so many kids that can't get to those. We have to have a stronger investment in after school. The second bucket is the response to crime. And we know that the response to crime really is mostly police, but so many people in our communities have mental health trauma. And the response to all trauma can't be somebody with a gun. You know, I was talking sure. to somebody who was calling for help when their friend was about to commit suicide and an officer showed up. And that just isn't the role of officers. And the third is around solving crime and that really is police work but that requires trust and accountability and community and you know in Baltimore it's not against the rules of chokehold or um, hog tie people okay. we can't automatically drug test officers who are involved in deadly force shootings and me and Commissioner Davis agree that there shouldn't be alternate hearing boards when officers are disciplined internally that doesn't make sense so I'm calling for a host of common sense reform uh, that will actually change people's lives today and tomorrow talk about reconnecting with Baltimore as well how's that gone for you we know you've had a, a great national platform a large presence how do you downsize that if this becomes your administration? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, I've been in Baltimore more than I've not been in Baltimore. Okay. So open up an after school center for middle grades uh, mm -hmm. out of Ashburton, trained and supported a third of all the new teachers in the city for two years. And then I was a number two human capital um, here in the school system. So, so much of my work has been rooted in Baltimore that started in 99 as a teenager and has continued. And I've been able to leverage all of the things I've learned uh, from being in other cities for the past 18 months. Or, and also when I was a teacher, um, you know, in New York City, I've, I've used those experiences uh, to really build this platform and to connect with people in a different way. So I think that the policy platform is the most robust out there and the only one that's really focused on the concrete solutions across mm -hmm. a range of topics. As a former teacher, tell me a little bit, what would you like to see in schools change? Oh, so when I think about the school system, you know the mayor doesn't control schools, and I think mayoral sure. control in and of itself is not necessarily a solution. But two things that we can do immediately. One is around our adult literacy problem. So mm -hmm. we, we have about 40% of our adults cannot functionally read. We can make, an, a, we can make a diploma granting program for adults that we can do today. And we can make sure that that uh, is really robust because we know the community college graduation rate is really low. The GED pass rate is really low. And that is all often an access issue, it's not a skill issue. And the second is about home visits for our earlier okay. learners. So at zero to three, four to five, we can actually scale home visits across the city. We can make sure that every kid born with birth cohorts of about 7,000, we can make sure every kid has their first library. We can do those things. We know okay. that the single biggest impact on a kid's reading level is their mothers, and importantly, it's not fixed. We also know that kids need books to read. All right, you stay busy, man. Yeah. I appreciate you yeah. coming by. Thank Good you. to see you. Yeah.